Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, we are reading Copper Sun by Sharon Draper, and we are now on to chapter eight. And that chapter is called uh, Toward the Edge of the World. Hours passed. It was impossible to tell if it was day or night. Amari was unbelievably hungry and had to relieve herself. She was still chained and had no idea what she should do. She nudged Afi, who, as usual, usual was watchful and awake. Feel the motion of the ship of death, Afi whispered. Amari could feel a gentle rocking, rhythmic and constant. It feels different somehow, she told her. We float on the face of the sea, Afi murmured, and we travel toward the edge of the world. Amari started to ask her how she knew, but then she decided to trust Afi's instincts. There's no escape, Amari asked, even though she was certain of the answer. Not only is there no escape, there's no land to escape to. They have stolen that as well. Mari did not understand. She had no time to ask her, for at that moment several sailors, with cloths tied around their faces, came down, unchained the feet of the women, and led them up out of the hold. After climbing the ladder up to the deck, Amari gasped with astonishment. Afi was right. The land had indeed disappeared. Bright blue water surrounded them. The beach, the fort, the small boats, everything had vanished. One woman lurched at the sight, grabbed Amari's arm, and squeezed it so tightly that she left marks. She mumbled words in a language Amari did not understand. Another woman fainted. Some covered their eyes from the sudden brightness. Others cried out fearfully. Afi said nothing. She had no. Uh, just real quick note. Um, usually in Africa, remember, and, and sometimes this is hard for uh, people in America, especially younger people who don't know, uh, to understand that there are several different countries in Africa and uh, there's different tribes within those countries and a lot of times all those tribes speak different languages so Afi is is UA so she understands UA and Ashanti because of the Ashanti tribe that was in Ghana but once you leave Ghana go outside that realm there's other languages and even though you may know the tribe you and some of the dialects you may not understand precisely what they're saying even if you can pinpoint where they're from so uh, just a quick note or some people would wonder like why don't she understand the language they're both from the same continent true but there's many different countries and different tribes and different languages i just wanted to make that known the sailors throwing salt water on the women from buckets on the deck began throwing salt water on the women from buckets on the deck excuse me the water stung amari's wounds and coated her with brine other women twitched and howled as the water hit them, and the sailors laughed at their discomfort. A barrel had been set on one side of the deck for the women to relieve themselves, and they were given food. Some kind of beans mixed with an oily substance that Amari could not identify. It was horrible, and she gagged as she swallowed it, but she ate it all. A sailor spoke sharply to the women. They all stared at him blankly. He repeated himself again and again. Now you dance! Dance! Dance, you monkeys! Dance! None of them had any idea what he meant. Finally, a young white man who looked to be about Amari's age brought out a small drum and began pounding the beat. It was just a simple, basic rhythm. Drum dum, rum dum, drum bop bop, drum dum, rum dum, drum bop bop, over and over again. The women looked around in confusion. The doll beat made by that foreign drum carried no message and certainly offered no cause for celebration. It was none of the life and voice our drummers were able to coax from a drum, Amari thought. And again, let's stop for a second for a quick note where he's saying dance and call them monkeys. Um, that is a common uh, or used to be a common racial slur to use against African-Americans um, for whatever reason, slavers and white supremacists and slave owners. Um, they thought that Africans, uh, because they lived on the continent and because those were some of the animals that lived on the continent of Africa, monkeys and baboons and so forth, apes, um, they would think that Africans or people of African um, descent uh, were very, very, very closely related to like monkeys and chimpanzees, um, like almost directly, like there, there wasn't much difference between the two. Um, that's why when you guys see there was controversies a couple years back uh, about the H and M guy and uh, with the with, with the shirt and there's a monkey monkey swinging from there and there's like the 
uh, sharpest little monkey in the jungle or something like that. That's why phrases like that sometimes cause um, outrage amongst amongst people in the black community. And if you don't know it, sometimes you'll wonder, like, why are they tripping about certain things? It's because a lot of words and phrases that uh, people use, um, especially people who aren't in the black community, a lot of times those phrases are racist or they have a racist history behind them, a context to them. So when people are getting outraged, usually it's because for years and years, centuries, um, people have been using these phrases or these words to denigrate and talk down to African Americans, Africans, um, people of different complexion for for hundreds of years. And uh, as you read the book, you'll notice that a lot of racial slurs or um, racist sayings that people would say to African Americans or things that you hear now that you may see people get upset about started way back during the time of the Atlantic slave trade. And this is just one of those instances. And you'll see a few more as the story goes on. Uh, Sorry, just wanted to uh, clarify that. A a whiplash stung Amari's face, and she jumped. The sailor holding the whip nodded, pointed to her, and jabbered some words as he hopped up and down. Amari then realized what the men wanted them to do. They expect us to dance or at least jump to this horrible rhythm, Amari thought incredulously. Slowly, reluctantly, the women began to jump. Amari supposed it was for exercise, but it was also for another purpose. She noticed with a sickening realization. Most of the women, female captives, had on very little clothing. Their clothes had been ripped and torn and stripped from them since they had been taken from their homes. The sailors, all carrying knives or guns, walked among the women as they danced. They watched the women closely, sometimes touching their bodies. The women knew what the men were looking for. One of them, a huge man with bright orange hair, kept watching Amari. She had never seen a person with hair that color before, and he frightened as well as fascinated her. He never touched her, but while the women danced, he noticed, she noticed he kept his eyes on her face rather than on the rest of her body. That may be a little bit of foreshadowing, so try to figure out. He's just looking at her face. He's watching her. He didn't touch her like the other sailors were touching and groping on, um, on the African women. At the end of the dance, instead of being taken back down to the hold where they had been chained all night, the women were tied to the sides of the deck. The children were untied and allowed to run free. Keep your child close to you, Afi told one mother. Who knows what these strange men like to eat? The mother nodded and grabbed the boy. It wasn't exactly pleasant on the deck of the ship. It was dreadfully hot, and the constant salty wind on her face only increased her thirst. They had been given no fresh water to drink since the first meal of the morning but Amari was glad to be away from the stench at the bottom of the ship. They will come for us tonight, Amari whispered, uh, Afi whispered to Amari, jarring her thoughts back to a harsh reality. They treat us like animals, but tonight we'll be forced to be their women. But, but I I do not know what to do, Amari wailed, thinking with embarrassment of her dreams of lying in Bessa's arms after they were married. Submit in silence. If you fight back, it will go worse for you, Afi said sadly. Perhaps it is better to die, Amari told her sharply. Afi sighed. If you die, they win. We cannot let that happen. They have already taken everyone I loved, Amari replied, ashamed to look at Afi in the face. And tonight, they take the only thing I have left that is truly mine. Death will be a relief. You will live because you must, Afi said sternly. I should welcome death, but I cannot. Not yet, and neither can you. She turned away from Amari and looked out at the sea. Amari did not know how to reply. She trembled violently at the thought of one of these strange, smelly, milk-faced men taking her against her will. Shall I throw myself overboard? She thought. It would be so much easier to give up and die. Yet, she could not do that, and she didn't know why. The male captors were brought to the deck next, a few at a time. They also screamed as the salt water was thrown on them and then they were forced to perform the same horrible dance. Amari listened to the thunder that their feet made and thought ruefully, hmm, the feet of my people bring forth rhythm, even when the noise of the white man can produce none. Afi nudged Amari and whispered, Death has come for some of us. Amari stared as several bodies, stiff and lifeless, were pulled from the decks below. The sailors, again with cloths tied around their mouths and noses, 
unceremoniously tossed the dead men overboard. Mario was too numb to even remember the words of a prayer. The male slaves, like the women, were not allowed to stay on the deck after they had been fed and made to dance. They were whipped and chained and led back to the uh, fetid dungeon where they had been all night. Every hour, a few more were brought up and put through the same routine, until at last there were no more. The sailors cleaned up the deck and whistled cheerfully. Night was approaching. Amari looked at the sun as it disappeared into the sea. It burned coppery bright and beautiful. She tried to sear that beautiful sight on her memory as a shield to the ugliness that she now knew was about to happen. So the copper sun at this point is like an image, um, kind of peace, serenity, um, that she tries to hold on to. Um, and some of you guys can guess what do you think is about to happen to uh, some of the women as the sun goes down, as it starts to get night. Um, Afi alluded to it. Um, you kind of tell through some of the context clues in the story as well. So, uh, But here we are finishing chapter eight. And we'll be going to chapter nine. Uh, thanks for listening. And we will see you in a bit.